Yeah, hello and welcome. Um, neural nets are quite the hype today. Um, and I want to talk about why they became mainstream, as so how it began, the recent advancements that led to neural nets being the mainstream now, uh, what you can do with them, the applications, and then we'll cover some examples with the underlying ideas. And to round it up, we'll also talk about limitations and risks when you're using neural nets. And then we'll cover some alternatives and I want to give you some technical takeaways also if you want to implement your own. So about the history. It all began with a logician who worked in the field of computational neuroscience. He's called uh, Walter Pitts and McMulloch. On the left side you can see him and he's written a paper on what the frog's uh, eyes tell the frog's brain. And so um, he began using threshold logic and Frank Rosenblatt then formulated a perceptron in 1958, also using threshold logic. So what is it? It's basically a weighted sum of inputs. And if this weighted sum of inputs exceeds some thresholds, you output one, and if not, you output zero. So the basic perceptron was really simple, but it already has some limitations. So if you want to, to model some AND or logical OR function, you can very well do it. If you want to model the AND function only uh, on the upper right half, uh, there would be a 1. And it's perfectly linearly separable by this upper line. But if you've got an X OR function, you've got two ones, as you can see in this graphics here. And this does not work using a single perceptron. So this was one of the limitations why people thought that neural nets are not that powerful at all. But nowadays we know that nearly everything is possible using just one hidden layer and we also can apply this to, to the modeling of an XOR um, by modeling it um, via the OR function, NOT AND function and an AND. So uh, the first working neural nets um, were in 1965 by Ivanenko. He already got it working with some layers. Um, but backpropagation was not there at that time, so training was very difficult at this time. And that's why Marvin Minsky greatly discouraged the use of neural networks in 1969, and research nearly died for, for decades then. Because computational power was not there, training was very expensive, and uh, people thought it not to be so powerful at all, because even the XOR function could not be modeled using a single perceptron. But in 1975, Paul Werbos uh, from Harvard University wrote a paper about an algorithm called backpropagation. And this is essentially the method we're nowadays using to train our neural networks. It's all about gradient descent. So if you want to optimize some function, you just want to go into the, the minimum and you descend on this gradient. But nevertheless, um, computational power was not quite yet there. So research was reanimated a bit, but um, the power of neural nets was not um, um, accredited for at th that time. So there were many recent advances which led to the rise of neural networks. Let's first talk about uh, hardware. There were so many innovations. The processors are really fast now, and there are vector extensions which enable linear algebra to run really fast. And there are parallel processors, graphics cards became, um, became commodity and are really cheap and you, you just don't use a graphics card if, if, you, if you have not got more than 20, uh, 2048 threads. So, so this is the scale where you uh, start using graphics cards. And uh, low power chipsets are also on the rise. Right now, using your mobile device, there are chipsets uh, which are pretty capable of doing neural nets and object detection localization uh, or real time on your mobile hardware, uh, not using that much power. And also memory bandwidth uh, increased vastly because when you are, you, you've got very big neural networks, you've got a lot of, of weights and you, you need to access uh, memory very fast. So let's talk about uh, the Snapdragon architecture which you can see on the upper left half. So you can see there that there are scalar um, units and in addition to these there are vector uh, units, uh, units where you can do vector multiplications, additions and stuff like that really fast. So um, in the real world performance um, compared to the Creo CPU was um, 
made better by eight times and energy efficiency increased by, by a factor of 25 already. Um, on the bottom part, you can also see an architecture from ETH Zurich. They developed a something called parallel ultra low power platform and their aim is to break the picojoule per operation uh, barrier uh, within a power envelope of a few milliwatts. So this is really impressive. A picojoule is not that much. And on the right side, at the bottom, you can also see Google's tensor processing units. Uh, the addition in tensor processing units is that they also hardwire activation functions, which makes processing quite fast. So they say that they've got speed ups of uh, 30 times and power consumption is um, from 30 to 80 times better than compared to normal CPUs. Okay, but hardware is not the only thing that, uh, that has improved. Software has also improved vastly. There are so much frameworks which enable us to write parallel software right now. Open multiprocessing is quite old and, and established. Then in 2007, their uh, CUDA came along and NVIDIA uh, made um, processing on graphics cards available and their framework evolved and is quite usable nowadays and well documented. Also, if you don't want to have vendor lock into NVIDIA, uh, there are specifications by the Kronos group like OpenZL, which is open computing language, but they've got language constructs which do not map so well on the graphics cards because their aim is to, to compute on multiple different hardware devices and accelerators. And also, if you've got to, to move around a lot of data, of course, you need binary serialization. Uh, when we're using web, uh, web services nowadays, normally we transfer just some kind of JSON, but it's pretty bloated, or, or even XML. And Google Protocol Buffers is uh, an efficient uh, way to, to move data over the wire. So also, frameworks have evolved to build neural networks, like TensorFlow. TensorFlow can be run on a single machine using one or more graphics cards and it can be run in, in clusters of multiple machines even. And if uh, TensorFlow is too low level for you and you don't want to write a lot of code for, for model building, you can use Keras on top. Uh, when you're using Keras, you can build models in three, four, five lines of codes and fit them to data. So this is pretty much cool abstraction, I would say. And then there are other frameworks like uh, PyTorch and Cafe2. They are merging right now. I think they are already in the same repository and um, uh, Facebook is, is a big sponsor of that one. And because there are many other frameworks, um, there had to be um, some, some ex data exchange format because if you have a model in one framework and you want to evaluate it using another framework, uh, you need an open exchange format. That is what ONNX is for. It's, it's called Open Neural Network Exchange Format. So what we also, uh, what we didn't have at the time um, before are great data sets, big data sets and simulators. Because it's essential to, to have a lot of data, um, because neural nets have so many parameters and you need to, to approximate functions which uh, can be really difficult. So um, there are cool data sets if you want to, to do object detection or localization or even segmentation. Uh, like the COCO data set, it's called Common Objects in Context. And on the bottom uh, half, you can see, see that there is an explorer. You can just click on some uh, pictograms and it will search you an image. Um, this girl is having um, black trousers and a backpack, which you can see in green. Uh, when you look at the image, as it is, um, I didn't really notice the backpack at first. So this is quite impressive. And you can train on this data. It's open. It's a Creative Commons license. So um, you can use it. And now also the open image data set is uh, evolving and has uh, very much data in it. And you've also got labels uh, for things like cutlery, cutlery maybe a tool also. Uh, you can see a spoon and a fork here right now and you can, can use this uh, data for training then. And when we're looking uh, in the field of autonomous driving, um, there's a really cool simulator called Kala. It's completely open source. Um, it's sponsored by Intel and Computer Vision Center. And uh, they hired people to, to make open assets for this, well, for this simulator. Yeah, we, we can see it here. And um, 
it's there for training. It has got a well-defined API where can, you can use uh, reinforcement learning or imitation learning uh, just to learn how to drive. And you can simulate different weather conditions or lighting conditions. So this is uh, really a great way uh, for training because when you're simulating, you already have ground truth. Ground truth is like, uh, here's a pedestrian, or this is the, the lane I want to drive on, and so on. And this uh, really makes training uh, more easy because uh, certain situations can't, can't be tested in the real world, like crashes. You, you should not simulate them. Uh, you should not put people at risk. So let's talk a bit about the fields of application. Uh, the fields are very broad. And we can categorize them, for example, by technical tasks. There's the task of classification. You can say, hey, this is a car, banana, some what else. There's regression. Uh, if you want to fit some, some value, for example, if you're localizing, you, you say, um, this object is at this certain position in the, uh, in the image, for example. Or you want to regress a function. Then there's data generation. Um, neural nets are pretty capable of, of Generating data from other time series data like music, you can, you can train a recurrent neural net uh, and it can learn how to, how to make music itself. You can even do handwriting and other stuff. And then there's reinforcement learning and imitation learning, um, which is pretty good for, for applications like robotics or autonomous driving. So by industry, uh, there were major advancements in medicine, like, for example, the detection of cancer cells. And neural nets can detect cancer cells uh, earlier than uh, uh, doctors can, uh, because there are some visual clues um, that the doctors can't read out of images. Then radiology images, for example, are very hard to interpret. It's, it's just some black and white image. and. Perhaps uh, you've got a three-dimensional model and it's really hard to look at and, and to, to get data out of it. But using neural nets, you can really approximate a function that can learn if you've got uh, um, problems like, like problems in your lung or such things. And you can also visualize which part of the image contributed to the classification. So you can also learn how, uh, where to look. And this is pretty important for, for understanding. Uh, medicine better in, in the future. Then there are other things like time series analysis, like heartbeat anomalies, or you can also analyze digital patient records and uh, predict chances of other diseases which might come um, with your disease as well. But there are other uh, categories as well where neural nets perform very well. There's arts, photography, and images. Um, a basic thing you can do is imagery lighting. Sometimes you've got bad light conditions, the, the image is not that good at all. Uh, you can improve it. You can even add some details to images. And you can do artistic style transfer. This means if you've got real looking images, you can apply Monet style or something like that. You can make winter images to summer images, all that stuff. Uh, it also excels in wildlife observation because uh, if you're a photographer, some, some animals are really rare and hard to find. And when you're using classification, you, you can find when the animal is in, is in range and you can automatically shoot an image, for example. And you can also generate images. Uh, in fact, um, neural style transfer and um, neural image uh, uh, generation was invented in Germany, in Tübingen, at Beetke Lab. This is the Gattis paper I'm referencing here. And there are other tasks like uh, retrieval. So imagine you've got a big database of, of assets, uh, like photography assets, and you want to search for something, like um, you want to sketch a cat, or, and you retrieve photos uh, for a cat, or you can search similar images or things like that. Then another task could be captioning. When you've got an image, you can describe it and add metadata, so it makes retrieval later on um, via text form, via text queries, much more easy. Okay, and there's also image compression. Um, there was a paper from Google that said that you can uh, compress images uh, a lot better than JPEG. I think um, it's about a factor of 10% and they have less artifacts in the image. Okay, uh, let's stay in arts. Um, when we're talking about 
cinematography, video and audio processing. Um, you can do, for example, lip synchronization to new audio. There are speech to Obama, as an example, a neural network. You can put your speech into it and it, it generates uh, uh, Obama face with lip synchronization. And you can even see the wrinkles from time to time, so it's really realistically looking. Human post tracking with motion capture devices is pretty expensive uh, because you need all the devices. So you can also estimate human posts uh, via neural networks, which is much cheaper. And you can even uh, replace objects. Think of the, uh, the Google Translator app. You can just take a video and you get text translations um, in place. So this was uh, also pretty impressive. OK, and if you're using YouTube, uh, nowadays, not only eager people do the, the closed captioning and subtitling, it's already done automatically. There are sequence-to-sequence -sequence networks which convert the audio to um, captioning and subtitles. So let's have a look at, at arts. Uh, here we have an example of, of some photos uh, with neural style transfer applied. And here we've got a, a cycle again converting horses to zebras. Um, but it has a slight disadvantage. If you put people in there, then you will notice that people's skin is pretty much like a horse and they get zebra fight too. <laughs> so they've got the limitations. Another area where you can apply the neural nets is, uh, of course, security. It might sound a bit cre creepy. Um, in China, data regulation laws are not that much of a problem for people and research is government funded. So um, I think they've got the best models at the time. Uh, if you go to conferences, you, you just see so great tracking models, multi-person tracking models uh, coming from Chinese researchers. So it's a bit creepy too. So you can also get the metadata. Uh, like for example, if you're in, uh, at an airport, uh, you want to know when people are carrying luggage and when they place their luggage somewhere and, and go away. So with metadata, you can, you can do this. Or you can just do localization and tracking of people. You can find people again if you want to. Or detect anomalies. Uh, let's say at a train station there is, is a commotion. There's uh, um, much noise which is irregular. You, you could analyze this event and send the police immediately, for example. And then not so creepy at all is biometric identification. Uh, you all have got a smartphone and perhaps you're using touch ID or things like that and, and face ID already. Uh, this is mostly done uh, using neural networks. Then my favorite is computer games because I, I've played them a lot in my youth. Um, there are pretty much use cases like generating terrain, texture, or even avatars. With generative adversarial networks, for example, you, you can generate phases uh, using some facial features. You can say, hey, I want to have a nose uh, that's broad or small, slim. And you can just generate phases and you can create much more diversity in your computer games uh, instead of just having your five models of people. Then there's 3D reconstruction. Um, devices uh, that can do a 3D scan are also expensive um, and you can just take some images and do 3D reconstruction via classical methods or just approximate it using uh, neural networks. And then there's movements. It is hard to create realistic uh, movements in, in some, some kinds of terrains. Uh, let's say a, a dog that should jump over some, some, some fence or something like that. And you can generate it also. And fluid dynamics, for example, if you're thinking about um, open world computer games where you've got fluids, uh, then you know perhaps that fluids is pretty much hard physics and it's computationally in intensive. But a bad approximation with a neural net, which is maybe cheaper, uh, can achieve realistic looking effect at all. Yes, and of course, you can train bots uh, to find strategies. If you're thinking about games like, like this uh, Pong games with the bricks, you will notice that a neural net may learn that it needs to shoot the ball to the top, and it can just destroy all the bricks from there, and it is faster. And also, you can, can teach combat AI. And we'll have a look at that uh, later on. Then there's military. In military, uh, you've got things like UAVs, unmanned aerial vehicles. You don't want to, to fly a drone 
into trees or something, so you've got obstacle avoidance and vision in general. And there are transport robots like the big dog from Boston Dynamics. And the interesting thing is that if you push this robot, it can already compensate, it does not fall down. And of course you could make Terminators killing machines. I hope you won't. If you're thinking about defense like, like turrets, you, you also need, need vision. Uh, you need to see if someone has a weapon or not, or things like that. Then this is pretty much uh, um, equal to robotics. In robotics, you can build terrain adaptive transport systems uh, as well, like such a, a, a robot that can carry things. Or you can build humanoid uh, bipedal robots. You can see in this image uh, the Atlas robot from Boston Dynamics, which learned how to backflip. And this is not an easy task. Have you tried backflipping yourself? It's not so easy. You, you often fall down, you, you get hurt. And the robot is very expensive. Um, so you can, can also apply some, some simulation before that uh, when you're doing reinforcement learning, for example. And you can apply some, some adversarial forces. So um, the real world won't be like your simulation. It will be a bit, bit different. So you just apply some, some forces that disturb the model and it should recover. And then you can, of course, transfer it to, to the robot in the real world. Uh, this is called domain transfer, which works quite well. And you can also do self-supervised learning because uh, getting data is, is very difficult and expensive, but you can do things like put an accelerometer sensor into the robot and when it should learn how to walk, uh, you can say at a certain uh, um, angle of inclination, uh, the robot does not perform that well. So you can self-supervise the process be before the robot falls. And industry robots can learn how to grasp things and, and uh, similar things. Yeah, in automotive, uh, perhaps you want to do end-to-end uh, -end decision making for, for driving, but nowadays I would say um, please don't. There are certain situations you should uh, rather really encode in rules um, because you don't want a probabilistic uh, system to handle them uh, if you already know what you want to do. And also the systems nowadays um, make predictions on the current frame and this is not enough in my opinion because if you see the road and you plan some trajectory, and then you get blinded by the sun, you've got a problem. Uh, let's say the neural net uh, outputs another trajectory. This may not be possible. It's, it's not temporarily consistent because you've already seen the trajectory ahead. So a single observation should not make this result useless. Yeah. Segmentation of the road scene is also an important task. So it's not about uh, uh, just localizing bounding boxes or things like that. It's, it's really pixel-wise segmentation of road lanes, areas where you can park, and so on. And you want to detect dangerous situations. Perhaps a human post could tell you that someone is about to sprint over the street, for example. And of course, do some detection and localization and the, the um, boring stuff. If you want to localize your, your vehicle, you, you can also use neural nets. Um, in fact, uh, things like, like SIFT with active search to, to find out where you are in a certain terrain uh, works well when you don't have occlusion. But if there are any trees or something that changes your image, uh, these classical methods do not perform that well at all. And neural nets have uh, uh, outperformed those models by a big margin. OK, let's go over to education because it's also um, a very interesting area. In education, you can do things like intelligent character word or sentence recognition or, or whole expressions. Uh, perhaps you've seen apps where you can scan um, a, a mathematical expression and you get it evaluated already. So it can help your, your children uh, by doing homework. Yeah, or, or they don't do the homework anymore at all. May also happen. Then there is voice synthesis, you, uh, you can use this, for example, in the Duol Duolingo app. It's, it's an app for learning languages. Uh, they're using voice synthesis a lot because if you need a speaker for each and every sentence, this may be quite expensive too. And you can even use uh, voice recognition for language trainers. So you can say some things and it will uh, compare the similarity if you've uh, got the pronunciation right. And you can also do some, some grading tasks uh, because teachers normally are not that objective at all. 
If you're taking an average, um, you may have a more objective grading of handwriting or even essay grading. And there's a Kegel challenge, Kegel competition, uh, which showed that uh, neural nets uh, or other um, machine learning tools can quite outperform teachers. So when we're thinking about other things like uh, bureaucracy, um, there are a lot of documents involved in some situations. Uh, let's say you're in insurance and you want, uh, you've got some, some letter and you want to know what's happening. If it is uh, a case of uh, fraud or if, if some, um, it's a damage case or something else. So you can classify uh, this as well. And you probably want to digitize uh, also some data because um, you want to process it later on. You can digitize bills. There are already apps where you can do personal bookkeeping. You just scan uh, your bills and you even get it back in tabular form. So this is already great to process further. And then there are, there are topics like semantic parsing and question answering. Um, perhaps you, you know it from school. Uh, you get some questions, then you read a text and you shall answer these questions. And you can approximate things like that also. And you can do things like uh, text summarization if you want to find certain texts or documents again. And of course, there's machine uh, translation. Perhaps you've used it already. The models um, yield quite uh, impressive results nowadays when you're converting languages like German to English or even to, to Chinese or Japanese. And perhaps if you want to do more learning on your documents, you want to anonymize them. And that's also a function which can be uh, pretty well approximated by neural nets. Then when you're thinking of your smartphone again, uh, there are digital assistants. And digital assistants um, are relying on, on voice uh, processing. So they're speech to text and text to speech to process language queries and to output the results when you're using, for example, Siri. And perhaps you also want to, to retrieve things. Yeah, it's retrieval. OK, uh, wildlife preservation, I think we've already covered that. When we're going into another area like logistics, um, there are hard problems like packing or route optimization. And in fact, they are computationally expensive. And also here, an approximation can do pretty well. So also, if you're, you're a finance guy or you want to, to increase your wealth or lose it all at once, you can employ models that predict the stock market. But you need to, to pay attention, because when you're doing high frequency, um, you can earn money quickly and you can lose it quickly, too. There were several companies which lost their fortune in, in one second. Yeah, but there are other cases like, like credit rating. If you're selling products, um, there are people you don't want to sell to because they can't uh, pay the bills. And based on, on some factors like um, where someone living and so on and so on, uh, you can do credit uh, rating, for example, or bankruptcy prediction if a company is likely to fail or things like that. And also, if you're thinking about uh, fraud, you, um, you don't want uh, other people to use your, your credit cards or um, things like that. And you can, you can use neural nets, for example, also in an unsupervised um, fashion to create clusters of normal looking activity. And then there's the, the unnormal activity, like someone is using my credit card in Uganda um, two hours later. It's not possible for me to travel that fast. So it will fall outside this cluster, for example, and uh, you know that it's fraud and you can uh, just uh, lock the card. Yeah, computer vision, we've talked about a lot of topics already, I think, but image segmentation uh, is really cool, and the task of super resolution was quite, quite impressive for me. So if you don't have the information in an image, if you have a low quality image, you can just hallucinate some higher resolution into it, because uh, neural nets can um, approximate some distribution, and they know that if something looks like, like a, a building, uh, they know that they should uh, input some, some, some uh, windows or things like that into it. So super resolution is really cool, and you can generate fake images quite well. <laughs> OK. 
Yeah, 3D reconstruction is also um, uh, very cheap using such, such networks. Um, even in, in construction, they're using it to, to replicate certain parts. Um, or you can do visual quality control. Um, as a reminder, normally you can do everything that is a simple cognitive task to the brain uh, using a neural network approximation. Or you could just convert um, an image to vector graphics or other things like that. So we've covered a lot of ground. You see now that neural nets can pretty much be used everywhere. And when you go to a conference, you see that they are constantly outperforming classical methods. So um, I want to tell you um, about a few examples. And we are going to, to dive a bit deeper into the ideas so that you can take home a bit more about neural nets. So um, you could, for example, teach a robot arm to perform some tasks, like manipulate a, a rope into a certain shape. And this is not that um, difficult at all, because you just need, need uh, some, let's say, convolutional neural net to process the image. And you give some examples how the rope shall be manipulated. You can see it on the bottom. And then you input the current state and what you're expecting to, to get out. And then when the robot arm modifies uh, the rope, you can check if it matches the expectation or not. And you can adjust your model uh, accordingly. Another robot arm task would be grasping. And when you're doing grasping tasks, uh, you can also perform multitask training, which greatly improves the internal representation of your networks. So for grasping, you need to do localization, for example. You need to do detection. What kind of an object is it? But if you have to grasp, shape is very uh, important, too. And when you're learning about shape, when you're grasping, it also improves the detection model. So you can perform multiple tasks using the same network and get better representations. Then what we covered uh, previously a bit is the terrain adaptive locomotion skills. This is a deep reinforcement learning method. And they employed an actor critic model in that. That means there's an actor which decides which actions to take. And there's a critic which evaluates the score if the action is good or is not good. And as you can see, this is a dog with, I think, 21 limbs, because you can see the whole body moving. And it's impressive to, to have such a, a vivid animation. And it looks quite uh, realistic also. When we're thinking about human outperformance, we need to talk about computer games again. Here you see some Atari and, and old uh, games, which are pretty simple. And in the left half, you can see that neural nets already outperform human players. And there are only a few um, um, games which are not outperformed by, by, um, by the machine. But in fact, there are games which are more hard to play like Pac-Man or Pong or things like that. Uh, imagine an ego shooter. You, you need a very quick reaction, and you need to plan some things. You, you need to navigate in a maze. You want to avoid acid pools. You need to pick up medikits. You need to make some frags. You need to avoid um, um, running into rockets or things like that. So it's, it's a lot more complicated than these, these easy 2D games. And in fact, reinforcement learning approaches which accumulate rewards over time uh, can take a long time to train, and they might not perform that, that well. But in such computer games like ego shooters, um, you only need a very short attention span. And Flatline Coltoon published a paper. Um, it's called Learning to Act by Predicting the Future. So he's just predicting some future measurements like health, ammo levels, and frags instead of doing the whole reinforcement learning stuff. And he's looking into the future like four seconds, I think. And the, the method is, is that you take an observation stream. It's the image. Um, the current model is based on solely one image. And you've got a measurement stream, which can be contained in the observation stream as well. The measurements would be the frags and so on. And you've got a goal function, like I want to play defensively, or I want to make as, lot, uh, um, as much frags as possible. And then the model should, um, should um, compute an expectation stream. 
uh, averaged um, over all the possible actions you can take. And there's the action stream also, um, which will tell you how a certain action will affect the prediction, which you can compare to your target function. And the cool thing about this approach is that you can vary the target function at training time and at testing time. So you can really just adjust some parameters and you can make the defensive player much more aggressive. So this was uh, very impressive because the model kind of generalized here. It was not a mere approximation, it was already a good generalization. And then there's, there's a whole field of other networks called generative adversarial, adversarial networks. Um, Ian Goodfellow, for example, is an advocate of this, these ones and he's fa very famous right now. The basic idea behind this is that a generator and a discriminator play a game against each other. So the generator takes some, some input, this is called latent space, and it should generate an image, a fake image, for example. And you've got the real examples, like the real images. And then you've got the discriminator, which uh, should um, say if the image is the real one or if it's the fake one. And if the discriminator is correct, uh, it's good for the discriminator, so you want to minimize its loss. And as loss function for the generator, you just maximize this loss. Because if the discriminator is wrong, it's good for your generator, because the discriminator could not distinguish between re real and fake images. And using this methodology, you can, you can train models that can produce realistically looking content uh, in, in quite a variation of, of things, because you've, you've got the latent space and can change the input slightly. Let's say like um, adjust facial features or things like that. And there are certain examples. Um, when we're talking about picks to picks, for example, you can, you can do sketches. Um, they are the, the latent input. And the network will generate phases or cats uh, for this, this. And then there's a very recent paper from NVIDIA. It's about progressively growing uh, general adversarial networks. Because um, when they were invented, they were very, very difficult to train. Training stopped because of gradient problems and so on. And sometimes there was even mode collapse, which means that the discriminator cannot really learn things. And uh, in this paper, they found out um, that you can progressively grow the models. So you just begin with, let's say, 16 times 16 pixels, images of faces, and you refine them progressively, uh, let's say, up to 1024 times uh, 1024 pixels. And the results on the left side are quite compelling. Uh, quite compelling. I think um, it's realistically looking. If you are looking at the images on the right side, we can already uh, see some weaknesses, like, like in the hair or next to the ears. You see that, that the face does not blend in with the background so well at times. But um, I think um, the model performed really good. And if, if you imagine, you take some celebrity uh, um, data set, and then you, you could generate your, your models for computer games out of that. And uh, you need to do only uh, minor adjustments. And you've got a quite a variety of, of different face models. Yeah, that's why we should also talk a bit about uh, limitations because we've seen that not all the pictures were so well. Um, to understand the limitations and risks, we should uh, talk a bit about the universal approximation theorem at first. Let's imagine you've got a small neural net and you've got a sigmoid activation function. This is the S shape. You can modify this function uh, when you're playing with the weights and the bias, and you can make it quite like a step function, uh, which uh, just does the step at a certain x value, let's say like at 0.4 in this example. And then, this is the output of the, the intermediate neuron here. And if you want to approximate functions, you just sum up the, the different neurons and the steps activate at different times. So at 0.4, the step of 0.6 here activates, then, then we are at 0.6, and uh, when the x value is at 0.6, we just add a negative, negative 0.6 here, and uh, the function goes down again. And as you can imagine, you can just put more neurons into it, 
and that is why you can approximate nearly every function. As you can see here, the approximation is not that good, but if you're putting more neurons into it, um, the deviation from the real function will get smaller. So basically you can approximate everything that is um, uh, differentiable because you're doing back backpropagation in neural nets. So is it a cure for everything when we can approximate everything? Perhaps. As we have perhaps uh, seen already, you can only do interpolation. You've had a certain range of x values and the model could only predict within these x ranges and you can't do extrapolation. So neural nets might not perform well on unseen data in cases. Then there's limited accuracy. We've, we've seen that we had to put quite a few neurons um, into this model to, to um, fit the function which contains some, some sinus functions. And we don't get the real function back. We've, we've got a model with quite many neurons, but we don't find the function uh, um, containing the, the uh, sinus function here. So if you already know things about your real world model, please code it into your model. If you want to approximate simple things like multiplication, you can't do it well using, using uh, sums. Um, you, you could, you could um, process your input and, and put logarithms into it because sums of logarithms are multiplication as well. But that would require input processing. So when we have to use uh, quite a number of neurons, then there is um, uh, overfitting could happen because we could, for gaining accuracy, we could just um, map every, every uh, things we've seen uh, into our model and it does not generalize that well. And then the model needs, of course, to be differentiable because we're applying the backpropagation algorithm with the gradient descent. And we could get stuck in local optima during backprop, but this is normally not the problem because you've got such a vast set of parameters that some, some part of the model might get stuck, but the other part won't get stuck and compensates for this fact. Also, training stability is not easily achieved. Uh, there are problems like vanishing gradients. A function like the sigmoid at its ends um, does, not, does not have an angle of inclination, so, so the uh, differentiation is, is near zero at the ends, and uh, when you're doing backpropagation in your neural net, you just have um, uh, uh, functions within functions, and if you are differentiating, you need to do multiplications, and then small values will get smaller and the gradient may vanish. Also, gradients may become too large. And this is not numerically st uh, stable because uh, when you're processing floating point values, um, they should be within the same uh, order of magnitude uh, to get uh, the precision. And then there are also adversarial examples, like Google published some, some report about um, um, adversarial patches. So you've got a banana classifier there. It can only classify a banana in an image. And you put the sticker into it, and it just classifies the banana as toast. But uh, in fact, other models like a single shot multi-box detector, which can draw multiple bounding boxes and find different objects within uh, the image, are, um, are not so prone for, for, for these uh, adversarial patches. But you can generate some noise, which just destroys your classification or localization. So this is quite a risk when you, when you employ that in your automotive pipeline when making decisions. So people could and will come up with things like that. And if you're looking at the Tesla, um, I think the Tesla has got a structural weakness because the autopilot um, just crashes into, into emergency cars, into fire emergency cars a lot, uh, if you've read the news about that. <laughs> so they like red cars and they like to crash into it. And perhaps your model can only approximate to, to a certain degree and it does not generalize at all. It does only approximate and uh, so on unseen data it might not perform that well. So are there a cure for everything? I would say not for everything, but you can achieve quite uh, compelling results in different areas as we have seen. You can even outperform humans, which is uh, I think uh, really impressive. When should you not apply um, neural nets? 
When you have a good guess about the real model, you just shouldn't do it. Perhaps uh, when, when you're modeling something, uh, you could, uh, could just apply um, backpropagation to it to learn some parameters. This is just called parameter learning. And when you need security and explainability, um, neural nets are not so good because it's only an approximation, it's not the real model and you can't say, hey, um, because of this parameter something's happening. You can only visualize uh, which parts of an image, for example, contribute to, to a certain classification. But you need a lot of retraining um, uh, using examples to, to get rid of the errors, of systematic errors and you need a good training data set. So this is why we also um, apply a simulation a lot to get this amount of data or we cannot produce in the real world. <coughs> and if you can do a rule-based approach, uh, it may be just very um, efficient and, and fast, then don't use a neural network with many parameters. And if you need optimality guarantees to say, hey, at the thousandth iteration, my model is 80% from the optimum, you can't do it with neural nets. But when you don't have a clue about the real model and you suspect that there is some pattern in your data which correlates the data with some output, then just apply it, see if you can find the pattern and maybe you've got a model that is already sufficiently good for use case. So approximation essentially needs to be good enough for you. Okay, but um, we've talked a lot about neural nets and there are also alternatives. Like, let's look at the OpenCV library. There are like thousand algorithms, uh, computer vision algorithms, classical algorithms for things like 3D reconstruction from stereo images because um, those are really physical models you can, you can build up quite well. And whatever is in your machine learning toolbox like SVM, Bayesian classifiers, regression methods, genetic algorithms, random forest methods, just try them out. Um, evaluate multiple models and compare the results because you can't tell in advance which model will be the best. And even using your models, you need to do some hyperparameter uh, training as well, uh, tuning as well. So as technical takeaways, if you want to implement your own neural nets, um, I could tell you that initialization and activation functions must fit together. Because we've seen, for example, that the sigmoid uh, function introduces vanishing gradient problems uh, when you are having a deep neural net. And you need to initialize value in a certain range so that you don't get to the end so quickly. So those must fit together. Then there are new kinds of activation functions like the exponential linear unit, which has some normalizing effect. So the, the data propagation in, in deeper models does not, does not uh, diminish and they make the training more stable. And I've, I found uh, that this works quite well because when I started uh, um, playing around with neural nets, the first problem I had was vanishing gradient, of course. Yeah? And using the exponential linear units, I, I didn't have that much of problems anymore. Residual learning is also a method, um, you, can, you can read it in the papers, which works fine with deep models. Perhaps you've, you've heard of the Microsoft ResNet. It's, it's a really, really, really deep model um, comprised of multiple um, like, yeah, modules which you can stack. And it works, works fine to train such models. Then when you're using convolutional neural nets for images, you can also combine it with LSTM. LSTM is long short-term memory and you use it to um, have some, some memory about um, things you've seen in the past. So you cannot only use them when, when uh, analyzing time series, you can also use them to correlate features you have found in an image, for example, which could make your detection pipeline uh, better. Then there are recurrent neural nets. When you want to do um, time series analysis, sequence-to-sequence -sequence models like, like translation, you can use recurrent neural nets. But some people say that attention-based mechanisms, which can be hierarchical, um, can outperform sequ uh, RNN sequence-to-sequence -sequence models already. Then we've heard a lot about single observations, single images making, making our action 
uh, basing our action only on this single frame. Uh, but uh, time is very important. If you want to, to transfer style in a, in a video, for example, you need some consistency. You don't want the second frame to be very, very different from the first frame because then you've got some flickering going around. And therefore, you can do uh, optical flow analysis, for example, uh, which has, tells you where the movement is and um, you, can, you can update your loss accordingly so that uh, the output will only change between frames where the movement was so that the rest of the image keeps stable when there's no movement at all. So observations over time are, are quite important. And if we're doing trajectory planning, I've already said, we, we don't want the model to tell us the trajectory is quite different uh, at some point in time. Uh, and therefore, we need some temporal consistency. And you're, you're seeing this term in research uh, used a lot right now. And then there's simulation and, and self-supervision, of course, um, which can help you um, for generating the ground truth, which is quite expensive to get in some scenarios. And an emerging area is also semi-supervised learning. Because labeling data is very, uh, very expensive. If you're just drawing bounding boxes, it, it works uh, quite fast. But if you're segmenting the whole image, if you, if you want to have a pixel-wise classification of things like, yeah, this is a head, this is um, yeah, the body, uh, this is the floor, then um, it's quite expensive to get this because people need to paint images uh, for classification. Uh, to get the ground truth. And uh, semi-supervised learning helps you because you, you need less training data and you can just add unlabeled data on top and your model gets better. This is normally achieved by, uh, for example, things like, like cycle consistency. So, for example, if you're classifying numbers, you've got a, you've got a model, um, you know that, that some number is classified as, let's say, six, and then you've got a similarity function, and you use this to get a mapping into your unlabeled data, and then you use this similarity function again to get back to your labeled data set. And if you return to a six again, the model did perform quite well. And so you can use this unlabeled data um, to, uh, in, in companionship with the, the labeled data to reduce your costs. And then, if uh, you're thinking about things like uh, text processing, you've got a lot of words in your corpus. You don't want to ho one hot encode them. You don't want one dimension per word uh, because it's pretty inefficient. You just want to have 512 dimensions or, or something like that. And you can, can use vector embeddings. And to learn representations, you could, for example, employ autoencoders or, or things like that. So that's I uh, what I want you to, to take away uh, to, to try your things out at home. Then there's, of course, some, some recommended reading. On archive.org, there are many, many papers, and they're for free. So you can just read them and be inspired. And then um, research um, had a bit of a bad uh, reputation um, some time ago because people claimed just some numbers. They, they made a model. They described it and claimed some numbers, and no one could reproduce it. And nowadays, um, there are QR codes and GitHub links in the papers. So you can just try it out at home. And the licenses are quite permissive right now. So it's, it's mostly MIT license. So you can even use it in your own products, which is pretty cool. So that's what I wanted you to know today. And I hope you had fun, you are inspired, and you want perhaps to, to use your own models. And if, if you're working at TNG or an e-fellow student um, or not, you can come to an open tech day, for example, and normally we've got some more in-depth talks there. So thank you for your attention. Yeah, we are a bit over time already. I think only one question, if some has one. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, you talked about face generation, uh -huh. and uh, in the light of Google Duplex, I want to ask, uh, to me it seems that we are not very far from being able to generate images, to generate videos, uh -huh. and to, to essentially forge proofs. Like you can forge a document, you yeah. can forge an image very well now. And yeah. how, how do you prove something in a court in the future? 
if everything is potentially fake and like witnesses aren't very reliable, um, how, how will our legal system work uh, in the light of neural networks? Yeah, um, personally, I think legal systems don't adapt very quickly. That's one of the problems. And I think uh, when you're using video evidence in the future, perhaps you need, for example, videos of different sources from different people so that you can say when you've reached a, diff uh, a certain quorum, um, then it is quite plausible that something happens. But of course, when we can re uh, generate realistic looking data, uh, you can just forge material and it will be quite a challenge in the future. So you also see this danger or am I crazy? Yeah, I think, I think <laughs> it, it will happen, yes. Okay, unfortunately time is over, so coffee break is starting, but if you have questions, I guess Matthias is available for you. So let's thanks again to Matthias. Thank you.